Um, <clears throat> we're still talking about meeting God. Meeting God. I keep reminding you that one day that's going to be a reality for all of us. One day we will all, according to what Paul wrote, we will all stand before God. But we've been looking in Scripture of some uh, real spectacular and amazing and, and breathtaking events when some, on rare, rare moments, there were people in Scripture actually got to meet God. Just for a moment it might be, but it, that little moment, changed their life, and they were never the same. Genesis 28, which is where we started, and we're not going to go there, but I'll just remind you, we started talking about Jacob when he had left home on the run, and that night, or one of those nights, somewhere along the way, he had a dream, and he saw angels going up and down the ladder. Now, a lot of people have encountered angels, and Hebrews says that all of us ought to be real careful how we treat strangers, because we don't know. We, we could be uh, in the presence of an angel and not even know it. But the incredible thing about his dream was not only was there was angels going up and down this long, long extension ladder that went all the way to heaven. Who was at the top of the ladder? Do you remember? It was God. It was God at the top of the ladder and God started to talk to him and made him some incredible promises. And Jacob makes vows right there. He says, wow. In the morning, he said, uh, uh, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't even know it. He makes vows to God, pours oil on a rock and has a covenant service right there with the Lord. And then off he goes. 20 years later, coming back with this big family, he don't have a station wagon, but he needed one. And uh, he encounters God again. And this time he wrestles with him during the night. And uh, we, we believe that that is a picture of the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. Some people say, well, no, it's a mighty angel. Whatever you believe, Jacob said that he had wrestled with God. That's, that's what Jacob perceived. He had wrestled with God. God will humble him in a very serious way because he will limp the rest of his life as a sign that he had wrestled with God. Changed his name to Israel. Last week we talked about Isaiah. He had a rare encounter, and it's even more unbelievable. He got to see right into the throne room of God. Isaiah chapter 6, incredible moment. One of those few times that in Scripture we're allowed to look beyond the veil. And the only time other really is in Revelation chapter 4 when you get to read where John got to see into the throne room of God. But uh, immediately, if you remember, immediately Isaiah was, was confronted with the reality. He didn't belong there and he wasn't fit to be there, and he had a problem, he was sinful, and the angel did something to remedy the problem. Do you remember what it was? He brought a coal from off the altar and touched his lips with it, and uh, what, what amazes me is that he used tongs to get it off the altar, but he carried it in his hand. <laughs> the angel carried it in his hands. He didn't have a mitten on and oven met, and he touched his lips, and he said, your sins are purged. Praise God. And Isaiah is now worthy to be in the presence of God, and God then calls him into the ministry. Rare occasion where Isaiah got to see God, because you know, and we keep saying this, the scripture says that no man can see God and what? Live. Live. You just, not in the flesh. Not in the flesh. In the spirit world, spirit doesn't die, but the flesh, huh? But there are some rare cases where people actually got to encounter God. Moses met God for how many days? 
40 days up on the mountain. He was in God's presence and lived. And buddy, when he came down off the mountain, he was glowing like a 500 watt light bulb. Well, we're in Genesis tonight, and we're talking about two other people that got to meet God. Their situation is absolutely, completely different than what we've been talking about. It is, it is so different that it stands out, start from any other person ever human on this earth other than Jesus. And what sets these two apart is they got to meet, to go, got to meet God every day. And what were their names? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Scripture tells us that God came down and met with them. Hey there, brother. Good to see you. How you been? Good to see you. At any rate, the, all these other people we're going to be talking about, this is a rare brief moment with Adam and Eve. Scripture tells us that God came down and met with them, and that was normal. That was absolutely every day's business to get to fellowship with God, ask Him questions, be in His presence, commune with God. That was the norm. Isn't that incredible? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and I know I said chapter 3, but we're going to build a little bit here before we get to chapter 3. In verse 26, how was Adam made? According to verse 26. Out of the dust? Well, according to verse 26. In God's image, does that mean if we had a Polaroid of Adam, if one existed, then we could look at that and say, oh, now I know what God looks like. Is that what that meant? To be made in his image? I would think more to be pure and right. All right. We're getting a little closer here. You know, the Bible says God is spirit. So to be made in his image or in his likeness, we're now talking about a moral image where wisdom and purity and holiness and righteousness and all of that is, is God's likeness more so than does he have red hair or brown hair? Does he have blue hair? Does he have no hair? I mean, what, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a quality of a personality and his inner qualities, likeness, truth, honesty, faithfulness, purity, holiness, that's the moral image, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, made in God's likeness. And verse, chapter 2, verse 7, now we get down to the brass tacks, Nancy. How was he made? <laughs> so he has, he has uh, ties to this world, and he has ties to the next world. Okay, he is made of the dust of the earth, and God scooped some of that up, and Patty caked him around and made him, and then what did he do with that that he had formed? Breathed into him. He breathed into him the breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. A living soul. The breath of God, that is the spirit, the pneuma, goes into this Human body made from the dust of the earth. The pneuma of God, the breath of God goes in. He is now a living soul. He is really of two worlds. He is of this earth and he is, spirit came from God. Wow. So, Adam and Eve are, according to scripture, they are sinless. At this point in time, they are pure. They have a spirit-filled existence. They have fellowship with God. They are created to worship God. Chapter 3, verse 8, and God comes to visit them. <clears throat> Ever wish you could just have God make a house call to you? <laughs> 
come down the sidewalk, come up the steps, come in and sit with you. Someday, someday that's, that's going to be a realm that we will be physically in. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. So we can be with him. Well, something happened in chapter 3 on this very day prior to the Lord coming to visit them. Something happened that will change their day, change their life, and change all of uh, history. What happened? Satan comes. Satan came and they sinned. So we need to deal with this because their happy home is going to be turned upside down, isn't it? And everything that they had enjoyed is going to be now strained. And uh, we've got a problem that's going to happen and uh, it's, it's uh, going to unfold in front of us. So Genesis chapter 3, we're going to read about what the theologians call the fall. The great falling away. Adam and Eve fell out of grace. They fell out of a holy state. They, they fell out of innocence. They fell out of a state of perfection. And uh, they're going to lose their happy home and be evicted. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, gives us the details in the play-by-play -play event. Bonnie reminds us there's a thing called a serpent, and who is in control of the serpent? Satan. He is manipulating the serpent, and the serpent can speak. Eve is not at all perturbed by that, saying, wow, a talking snake. Isn't that incredible? No, we get, we get the idea that maybe all the animals could talk at this point in time, so she is not awestruck by a talking snake. Or that I think that would be part of the story. So because it's not, we just assume that was normal. What did the serpent say to her in verse 1? He plants a seed, doesn't he? He plants a seed of doubt. And what is he really saying here? Kim, what, what, put that question into plain language. What's he really saying? But he changes it, doesn't he? Look at verse 1. He changes it. What was God's prohibition for him? God's prohibition was thou shalt not eat of what? The tree. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. But what does the devil say to her in verse 1? He said you couldn't eat of no tree. Ever. Of any tree. He changes the whole thing. And he casts doubt on God as if God's not being fair with her. God is holding out on her. He's denying her pleasures that should be hers, gratification that could be hers. And he exaggerates, completely exaggerates what God said. God didn't say, you can't eat of all the trees. He said that Adam could eat, but there's only one he couldn't eat from. I think he's saying, what kind of God are you serving anyway? You, 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 what kind of relationship is this anyway? He, he tells you you can't eat of, eat of any tree. Is he that really a good God, really? And he begins to create doubt in Eve's mind. Now, she should have said immediately, uh, he's a good God, and I love him. She should have said that and cut, cut that off immediately. But she paused and reflected on it 
and she's going to begin a line of reasoning that maybe this snake knows more than God. And maybe her own desires or opinion are equal to God. And she begins this rationale of maybe um, we're all the same anyway. Maybe I can eat of that and, and it'll be okay. So in verse 2 and 3, what does Eve say back to the serpent? And in verse 3, but then did she say, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Is that part of the prohibition? No. No. So not only did Satan exaggerate and say, ah, he's holding out on you, you can't eat of any of the fruit. She turns around and retells the story, and she does a little bit of exaggeration herself, doesn't she? What does she exaggerate? Touching it? Yeah. God said you can't eat of that tree. She's the one who says, oh, and we can't even touch the tree. He won't even let us near it. Now, maybe that was Adam's idea. Honey, I don't even want you close to that tree. I don't, I don't know where that came from, but it wasn't from God. Because Scripture says that God just simply said, don't eat of that tree. Now, she says we can't even touch it. Now, uh, God gave her a, them a prohibition for a reason. Eve is saying, well, I think he's a bit too restrictive. Uh, he won't allow any fun. I'm not really permitted to do what I really want to do. All I get is a bunch of thou shalt not. They only have one rule. <laughs> okay, let's put this in context. They have one rule. That's it. It's the only rule they've got. But she exaggerates that one rule and expands on it. And let me say this, and I've said this before probably. There's as much danger in... Uh, exaggerating what is sin versus eliminating sin. You know that? Some people say you can do anything. There is no such thing as sin. And some people go to the other extreme and say everything's sin. And you can confuse people and confound people and discourage people on both ends of the spectrum. When, when there's no rules at all or when everything's a sin, you're going to hell for everything you do. I remember one guy telling me when he was growing up that everything he wanted to do, he, Mama told him, he said, go to hell. You're going to hell for that. It didn't matter what he did. He wanted to go visit his friends. You're going to hell. He wanted to go to a party. You're going to hell. It, it didn't matter what he wanted to do. That's what he got uh, saddled with, and he said it was such a discouragement. He said it just, he said it just run me away. So there, there's, there's an extreme on both ends, isn't there, to, to be so... Over, overbearing or, or just no rules at all. <clears throat> Satan appealed to the forbidden object and somehow seemed to make it appealing and attractive and desirable. Verse 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, meaning that you could eat it. It was edible. It's not poisonous, poisonous. It is good. It is appealing. Scripture says that everything God made was good. So it had to look good, just as good as all the other fruit in the garden. But now she is drawn to it. It's edible. It's pleasant to the eye. And there was another context in verse 6. It, if you ate from it, what did, did the devil say? Make you wise. <laughs> Make you wise. Make you wise. And wise as who? God. Wise as God. If you eat of this fruit, 
Man, you don't have to go to college. You don't have to put in time, seminary. You will be as smart as God. <laughs> I turned it off. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. The desire for good and beautiful fruit was not wrong in itself. It's when the desire came to be like God. That's when Eve crossed the line. To look at it and see, yeah, God made it good. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty. It's attractive. He did a good job with that tree. But when she desired it in a way that it would make her wise and to be as God, According to what did. No, I'm stuck in your pocket. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> oh. Don't even think The sound effects of that are incredible. <laughs> well, Verse 6 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took at the fruit, and she did what? She ate. she ate, and she gave some to her husband, and he ate, and where, where did she have to call him in off the road? Was he up on the roof? Where was he? He was with her. He was with her. Some people... Leave that completely out. But the Word of God says he was right there the whole time. So uh, that's going to, that's all going to come out here a little bit. And immediately, and immediately their eyes were opened and they saw themselves condemned. They saw themselves as naked and they knew that they were wrong and they knew that they were guilty and they're covered with shame. They've lost their innocence, and now they know for the first time ever, they know what sin is, and they know what sin feels like, and they know what sin has done to them personally, and are they like God? No, not at all. They are now fallen humans. Fallen. They took the bait, and they fell for it. James 1 says in verse 14 and 15, each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed and then after sin is conceived it gives forth birth to sin and when it's grown it gives birth to death. Verse 7 says, now they know that they're naked and quickly, uh, what do they make clothes out of? Big leaves. I don't know, in the garden, the, the trees grew big and large. I don't know how many leaves it would take. Maybe one leaf they could wrap around them. I don't know, but uh, they were shamed, and human nature is to try to cover shame, and uh, they use fig leaves. People use all sorts of stuff today to cover up their, their shame. Verse 8, And now fallen humans are about to get to meet God. It's time for God to come down for his daily walk. What do Adam and Eve do? Hide. Hide. They hide. Why are they hiding? Because they're naked. They're ashamed. They're ashamed. Mm -hmm. And they're naked. They know they're naked. Yeah, and what else? They know they dishonored God. They know they've dishonored God. And they're afraid. Fear, for the first time in their life, they also know what fear is. I've never known fear before. There was nothing to be fearful of. And now, for the first time ever in their created existence, they're afraid of their creator. That's never been part of their existence ever before. And now they're afraid of God. Have you ever been afraid of God? I have, as a youth, scared to death. Scared to death. And I had to do something about that. They hide. Verse 10, Adam told God, I was afraid. 
In verse 11, God began asking questions to Adam. Uh, all sorts of questions. He comes calling him. Verse 9, the Lord called, and he called, and he called, and he doesn't want to take that call, but God's not going away. God asked him in verse 11, who told you you were naked? Who have you been listening to? Have you ate of the tree? And what is that you've got all over you? <laughs> what have you been up to? If God is all-knowing, omniscient, why is he asking questions? Because they need to admit. Exactly. He's, he's bringing out a confession, isn't he? God's asking questions. And whenever God asks questions, it's not that he's stumped and he doesn't know. He knows. He knows exactly where they are. When he comes looking for them, he knows exactly where they are, and he already knows what they've done. Well, Adam blamed who? Eve. Eve. Blamed his wife, and there is not a chance in the world that he married the wrong woman. <laughs> <laughs> Eve blames the snake and as the old saying goes the snake didn't have a leg to stand on <laughs> God is holy he is altogether righteous he is according to the scripture pure eyes and to behold evil and God begins something that is very very godlike. he begins his process called redemption and redemption is a process God requires a confession, and he questions Adam and Eve in order to get a full confession. Not to browbeat them, but to get them to confess. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive who? Ourselves. We're not deceiving God. <laughs> God knows Everything. So we're not pulling the wool over his eyes. We're deceiving ourselves. And we trick ourselves saying, well, God doesn't know because I haven't told him, so therefore he, he, he's in the dark about all that. Well, you're, you're lying to yourself. God knows. But verse 9 says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there has to be a confession, doesn't there? We have to get to the point where we confess and make right. The fact that God came calling and looking and asking is nothing but the grace of God. Think about that. The fact that God came calling and looking and asking and seeking is nothing but grace. What if a holy God would have just said, well, I will leave him in his sinful state? What if God would have said, well, that'll serve him. Serve him right. I'll just leave him and Eve there. They should have known better. But God didn't do that, did he? Praise God. He begins the process of redemption. And we know what that was. There's going to be blood shed. And there's going to be clothes made. And uh, there will be redemption. And there will be a covering for their nakedness. But more importantly, there's a covering for their sin. Because an animal has died and the blood has been applied. Now, even with that, there are consequences, isn't there? There's always consequences. There's forgiveness, but there's consequences. What is the consequences for the serpent? Yeah, he's not walking upright anymore. He is now, he's now slithering in the dust, and he now has an enemy. And who is his enemy? God. Man. All of mankind. I mean, I told Tamer and Rose last night, I saw a snake in the field, and it just bothered me. It got away from me. I mean, I'm sorry. I just, it bothers me. I mean, when I see a snake, there's only one thing that goes through my mind, and that is killing. And, uh, uh, 
had gone away from me. By the time I saw it, it was already getting into the weeds, and it was about five, six feet away from me. I also didn't have nothing in, with me to get after it, but I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to. <laughs> and I went over and stood by the weeds looking, thinking maybe I'd see it. But I couldn't. The grass was too tall. So there is animosity between mankind and the serpent. What is the consequences for the women folk because of Eve? Pain and childbirth. Pain and childbirth. Do you realize, now think about this, they have, when God pronounced this and said there will be pain and childbirth, she hasn't even got a clue what God's talking about. She hasn't even had a child yet. But number two, Adam and Eve have never known what pain is. So when God says you're going to have pain, like, well, what, what's pain? Some here get up in the morning and they never know what a day without pain is. They didn't know what a day with any pain was. Up to this point, that was, that was just God speak. Who, who knows? What, what's pain? What's pain? Well, they're about to find out, aren't they? So now there is going to be pain and travail and tears in the birth of children, and she's going to graciously pass that on to all womanhood in the world. Adam has some consequences. What's the consequences for him? He's going to have to work for a living. Well, now he was put in a garden to be a caretaker of the garden, to dress it and keep it. So that's right in his line to be a farmer. But what's different now? Weeds. Yeah, the, what happened to the ground? Hard. It was cursed. Remember, it was cursed. And uh, what did he say down here? Oh, verse 17. And he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not have eaten it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. And he's going to live a long time. You know, Adam lived, what, 900 years, something like that? That's a long time to think about <laughs> their mistake. Verse 18, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. I get the idea there was no thorns and thistles in the Garden of Eden. Now the thistle has got a beautiful flower, but don't try to pick it. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful purple bloom. Uh, you. Look, but don't touch. Thorns and thistles. Verse 19, what else did he add? By the sweat of your brow. By the sweat of your brow. I don't think that Adam and Eve ever broke a sweat in the garden. I think everything was just bad for them. I think it grew overnight. I think it was like you woke up in the morning, and like with Moses, the manna was there in the morning. There it was. I think that it was... Maintenance free. I think this, yeah, he had a title, but he didn't have he didn't have to do a whole lot because everything was perfect in the garden. Perfectly formed flowers, perfectly formed fruit. I go to Whole Foods or or look at some of that fruit and it's absolutely perfectly shaped, perfect color, absolute you think, how did they come up with that? Because what I grow up my house ain't nothing looks perfect. <laughs> you know? It's deformed and one side looks good and the other side does it. But in the garden, you get the idea that everything grew perfect. I mean, it is just, it, 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 it's perfection because it's a perfect place. And God saw all that he made and it was perfect. It was good, but I mean, it was top of the line good. It was perfection. And now... He's going to have to work hard, and I mean work hard, outside the garden trying to scratch out a living by the sweat of his brow. In the garden, life came forth with ease, beauty, and abundance. Now it's going to come forth by toil and sweat. It won't always be perfect, and it won't always be a bumper crop. And verse 21 that's when we read about the animal being slain 
blood obviously applied for their sakes and the animal skin becomes skin clothes for them. The good news is God did not leave Adam and Eve in the condition they were in. And aren't you glad he didn't do that with us either? He sent his son. Remember I said redemption's a process. All through the Old Testament, animals are being killed, animals are being killed. And then God sends forth his perfect son, the Lamb of God, and he is slain from the foundation of the world, according to Scripture. And he will make atonement for all the sins of the world. God can bless us even in our mess. In the midst of a wayward life where sin abounds, the Bible says grace much more abounds, and he works in our brokenness. That We don't have to hide and find fig leaves and live in fear. We can come to God. We read here a story that is so human-like that when people mess up, they want to hide. They're so ashamed. If they really knew what God was like, they would have came running when God came into the garden. But in the story, it's God coming looking for them, isn't it? God is coming, looking and calling and seeking and searching, and they're hiding. That's the gospel message we have, that God is looking for everybody, calling, seeking. What was the verse I used a few weeks ago? Behold, I stand at the door and knock right at the front door, calling. And if you just open the door, why, I'll come right in and sup with you and you with me and we'll have fellowship. That is the offer of God to all. So Luke 19 says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. It's not God's will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's the good news. <coughs> so Jacob encountered God out there in the countryside and he was a mess, wasn't he? He had lied to his parents and he had cheated his brother and he was on the run because his brother wanted to kill him. And, and as I said this a few weeks ago, it confounds me that God nowhere in that scripture confronts him and says, now, before we do anything, you, you, let's get this clean. There's no record of God confronting him, and yet he must have. But God made a way for him. And then when he comes back after 20 years later, God makes a way for a man that's still deceptive. Isaiah last week is in the presence of God, and he knows he has no business being there because he, he is in the presence of a holy God, and he's not. And yet God does something there to remedy Isaiah's problem. And the angel brings a call. And he's cleansed. And here we are in Genesis 3. And God could have said, God could have said, well, it serves him right. It's what they get. But he didn't do that. And he made a way, he made a way for them to continue on. Let's, let's take a moment here and talk about first, verse 16. Part of the conversation with Adam and Eve, verse 16, he says unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. I stopped there. I didn't include the rest of the verse because I wanted to deal with that later. Here we are later. What else did God add to that? Verse 16. Her desire would be for her husband. And? And that he would rule over her. I'm, I'm just going to stick my neck out here where the axe is swinging. <laughs> I don't think that's part of the curse. I think that going forward, they're going, now they're going to lose their happy home. They're going to be out here outside of the garden because God is going to put an angel there and nobody's going to be able to get to the tree of life. That'd be horrible, sinful people eat of the tree of life and then live forever in a sinful condition and with a body that's never designed to live forever here in this world. But that's grace that you can't eat of that and live forever here. I 
think that this has a whole lot to do with the fact that going forward, they need each other. And I think this is comes out of the fact that Adam was right there beside Eve and never said a word. When there's no scripture here where he counseled her and said, tell that guy to get lost. Don't, listen, don't be listening to the likes of him. I think that that comment right here, your desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee, is kind of, can I say that God is saying to Adam, you're responsible for her. This is part of your job as a husband is to care for her and to watch over her and he shall rule over her that not in some thumbs down, you know, in control, control freak. That's not what I'm talking about. And I don't think that that's what God wanted either. This, that's, and some people take that and run with it. But no, I think this is all about both of them outside of the garden. God is saying, you're going to need each other. And going forward, you are going to talk things out as a husband and wife. And you're going to discuss stuff together. And you're not, one's not going to do one one thing and then, and then afterwards tell, no, you're going to talk about it beforehand. Your desire is for him and his desire is to look after you. And, and, and uh, different roles there. I don't, I don't think that's part of the curse. I think that is God is talking about outside of the garden. They're, going to, they're in a new world that they have never been in before. They don't, know, they don't know what it's like to be outside the garden. So this is a new life going forward. I think God's saying uh, from here on out, this is, this is what it's going to be. It's not about Adam being authoritative with her, uh, but about both of them relying on each other. What do you think of that? Some guys would get upset with me over that and say, no, 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 that's my, that's my job to be in control. So, and God gave me that right there. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think? shouldn't be eating this. God said not to. He didn't bring none of that out. So I think God was trying to say, you need to think about this and maybe help her to think about it, you know, rather than do a sin or whatever. Could, you, could we say it's a mild rebuke because Adam did not... Uh, knowing that he was made first and knowing that he was in the garden for probably some considerable time. He named all the animals uh, before Eve was created because it's after all that that he realizes, hey, all the animals have a mate, but I don't. And God said it's not good for man to be alone. So th this, this went on, we don't know how long, but uh, I've always thought not so much that this is part of the curse, and some women think, uh, you know, that's, I have to be, you know, attached to my husband like that, and he is ruling over me. No, I don't think that's part of the curse. I think that is, God is saying to them, you're a team, and you need to work together, because from henceforth out, it ain't going to get no easier, <laughs> okay? Well, it's going to get hard outside of the garden, isn't it? Well, it's hard. Well, when, when, God told Adam that he couldn't eat of that tree. He didn't tell Eve that. He told Adam. Adam, when he was there and Eve took it, he didn't tell her not to. He took it anyway. So maybe since he 
didn't take the responsibility he should have had to start with, now he's going to have to be responsible for her. Yep. Yep. Because when God starts questioning, <coughs> who does he start with? Adam. He starts with Adam, doesn't he? Blames Eve. <laughs> and Eve blames but her. but God holds Adam responsible first. He starts with that. There, there's something to be said with that. Well, the good news is there's a redemption. Women say, well, this whole thing about pain and having babies, and we blame Eve. I got news for you, gals. There's pain in all the curse. Adam has pain too. He is going to work. So his joints hurt out there in the dirt, and there is pain. Matter of fact, Romans 8 says there is pain for the whole earth because it will be in travail until one day it is set free. So there's, there's enough pain to go around for everybody. <laughs> it's not just for the gals. Uh, the sweat of your brow is not easy street, is it? It's, it's, it's tough sledding ahead, and uh, uh, that's the news. Well... Verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken, and he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, lest somebody eat of the tree of life and live forever in this world. Eternal life is not for this planet. We are... We are uh, destined for eternal life because we have a soul. Our soul will live forever, but in, in bodies like this, that would be a curse, wouldn't it? Anything you'd like to add to that? Or anything I left out that just bothers you? Or inspires you? Well, they say that they have hunted for the Garden of Eden. You know, and he says it's east. He even says that he placed at the east of the gate of Eden the cherubims. So, but nobody knows exactly which way is east in God's <laughs> eyes. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And when God hides something, he hides it, doesn't he? Didn't he hide Moses' body? Yeah, and, and uh, people have looked for him forever. Well, I think when I read my Bible, God knows what each one of us needs. He knows that the woman is a weak, and, and but yet she's strong in some, some way. But God knows that we are weaker than the man. I mean, we don't have the strength the man has. I mean... Some men. <laughs> well, I really don't believe no woman has the strength of, of her husband. Unless he is ill. I mean, I know me and Harold used to wrestle, and he could always put me. <laughs> and, you know, I just read my Bible, and whatever God tells me, I believe it. I believe, that's the way I just believe. I mean, I, I believe God's word. I believe Bless your heart. And you should. We all should. Some encounters with God are glorious. Some encounters are spectacular. Some are sad. One of the saddest encounters to me is the rich young ruler who walked away. He was in the presence of the Son of God and he walked away. We have no idea what happened with him. Some would like to say, well, he changed his mind, came back. We don't know that. You know, that's, that's sad. This one here was a horrendous story, but it's got a happy ending because God made a way for them to still, still come to God. He made a way, didn't he? And he, he was there for, Matt, for Adam and Eve. He's there for us too. And for whosoever will, will love. Uh, I'm approaching. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's uh, 
telling of humanity. We, we see ourselves in every one of these stories. We, we see ourselves running from you. We see ourselves confessing to you. We see ourselves needing the blood atonement. We see ourselves serving you out of love and favor and grace. Thank you, Father, that you made a way for humanity, and we're part of that. We thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. We thank you, Lord, that uh, sinful people can come to God, and you will remove the stain and the fear and the shame when they confess and believe and walk with you. Now, Father, be with us as we go home. Keep us safe. Watch over us. Provide for our needs. Keep us safe in all we do. We pray for our family members that need God's attention. We pray that, Lord, you will be merciful to them and help them. For those that are sick, may you give a healing. For those who have lost loved ones, we pray, Father, for comfort over them and their hearts. And, Father, grace to go on in spite of the loss of a loved one. Father, give them faith to believe, to walk with you. Be with Joe, Lord, as he continues to recover from surgery. Father, bless this new heart. Bless his life. May he live every day to the glory of God. <clears throat> Father, for our folks who are still out, we pray that you'll watch over them and take care of them. We miss them. We pray the goodness of God down over them. Watch over them, Lord, till they can come back, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, as Paul Harvey used to say, and that's the way it was. <laughs>